my name is Robin. Um, I'm I've been working for the past uh, few months on uh, on ways to prevent drugs effects on the CNS from affecting brain computer interfaces. Um, uh, this paper is in progress. I'm actually working on it uh, right now. And my mentors are Dr. Alejandro Canisha Lombard and Dr. Anastasis Poliravas from uh, the University of Cambridge. Um, a bit of a background in brain computer interfaces. So they, ha uh, they have been used for more than 100 years, but uh, they have been getting some traction actually uh, quite recently, uh, because in the past century, uh, mainly EEG has been used uh, for diagnostic methods and um, study purposes, but now other kinds of um, BCIs, as we, uh, 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 which is the acronym used for brain computer interfaces. So new BCIs are being employed for more precise study and for uh, or clinical applications even. Uh, examples include EEG, e uh, COG and LFP. Uh, which can be seen uh, in the image. So EEG are the uh, electrodes that are placed on the scalp. Uh, I, I guess we all know them. Um, ECOG is basically intracranial uh, EEG. I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, by the way. Um, uh, so ECOG is a kind of intracranial uh, EEG. Uh, it has a much higher... Um, um, uh, it, it can get much uh, more precise results from uh, the neural activity there. Uh, and LFPs are a very uh, precise um, uh, units uh, such as, uh, well, um, it, they are basically Im implemented in the brain uh, quite deeply, so to say, and they can get um, uh, pixel, um, they can get uh, uh, various frequencies and they are very, very precise, even being able to record uh, one neuron at a time. Uh, now, regarding classification of BCIs, they are classified as open or closed loop. Uh, open um, means basically that you only record or only stimulate neurons, whereas uh, uh, closed BCIs, you use the uh, recordings to then stimulate neurons in uh, uh, driven by an algorithm. And there is also high and low resolution. Low resolution would mean uh, EEG, for example, uh, because they are not capable of recording very precise um, uh, neuronal potentials, while high resolution would be, as I've mentioned, um, um, LFPs, for example. Uh, purposes are uh, recording brain activity through uh, their electrical discharges uh, because neurons are basically running on electricity. It's not in the same fashion as, uh, for example, wires with uh, electrons flowing, uh, flowing through them. But um, these uh, the activities that neurons have uh, do, um, do elicit some electrical discharges that we can pick up using electrodes and thereby uh, have these recordings. Um, uh, other purposes include stimulating neurons to achieve uh, specific uh, functions and past projects uh, in this area of notable uh, mention are targeted neurotechnology restores working in humans where um, uh, researchers from Brown and other uh, universities have worked on uh, an electrode array that was implanted in patients that had the uh, um, the spine uh, um, sectioned and uh, by an accident, of course. And uh, this electrode array uh, managed to restore the walking in those patients by reconnecting basically the uh, brain to the uh, legs and they could push a button and just start uh, moving and push it again and they would stop uh, walking. Uh, Neuralink, which uh, I, I guess we all know by now, uh, developed by uh, Elon Musk's team, uh, which now has managed to, uh, as far as I'm aware, uh, just make a monkey uh, be able to play a game uh, without any physical touch, just through the mind, basically. Uh, and we also have high-performance brain-to-text communication via handwriting, where, uh, well, via handwriting is a bit misleading in the sense that um, the patient was only imagining or, well, uh, they, they were having the intent of um, of writing a certain letter and uh, this intent generated uh, an electrical potential in the, in the motor homunculus where all motor, um, almost all motor 
um, activity starts and uh, those uh, recordings were uh, registered, then they were processed and assigned uh, various letters and then these were, would appear on a screen. So basically uh, this uh, patient that couldn't uh, write, couldn't move their hands or any other part of their body would be able to communicate through digital writing to their mind alone. Uh, here are uh, some different uh, BCIs uh, and how they differ in the uh, in their recordings. So LFPs are, as you can see, uh, more precise, where they can take the spikes and the tropes of um, of brain recordings uh, much more precisely in that uh, areas. While uh, EEG and ECOG are um, uh, have a lot of a lot more noise from the surrounding brain areas. Um, my paper mostly focuses on caffeine uh, due to lack of proper time to actually tackle more drugs because every drug has a particular um, way of uh, interacting with the brain. Um, ethanol, for example, is uh, particularly the most complex in the sense that they start off as being uh, somewhat like a stimulant in, in terms of their activity, but then as dosage increases, they start to... Uh, resemble more an opioid. So I um, uh, actually um, researched the effects and still researching the effects of caffeine and how to tackle uh, this. Caffeine is, no, is a known stimulant, a weak one, um, uh, but although the fact that it is a stimulant, uh, it actually reduces EEG absolute, so the peaks and tropes, and reduces uh, EEG uh, mean values. Uh, mainly due to its um, effects on the, vas uh, on the uh, vascular system uh, in the brain. So um, the way a certain drug interacts with uh, EEG recordings and any kind of other BCI recordings um, aren't as much related to uh, whether they are stimulant or an opioid and uh, more to uh, what effect they have on the vascular system. So caffeine being a vasoconstrictor, uh, it lowers EEG recordings. Uh, main areas affected by, this, uh, by these changes and by this drug include the posterior side of the temporal lobes, uh, the occipital lobe and parts of the uh, frontal cortex. Um, the occipital lobe deals with, um, with uh, image processing with vision, so it is quite expected uh, for it to have an effect there. And uh, the, the frontal cortex, well, it mainly affects the motor homunculus, which again is quite expected. Um, the uh, waves that are most affected by caffeine, so in EEG we have uh, multiple waves that are uh, placed onto one another, and we have uh, ranging from uh, alpha, beta to gamma and delta, and so on. Uh, and each are, um, uh, they do correspond to a certain type of activity, but they are, uh, for example, alpha is uh, associated with, um, with um, uh, thinking and uh, using your brain for intellectual activities. Um, but um, they are all present at the same time. Uh, it's just that with certain activities, uh, they can become more pronounced and dominant uh, uh, than others. So uh, alpha waves are most affected, uh, followed by beta waves, and surprisingly, sometimes even delta waves in the uh, posterior uh, side of the temporal lobes. Uh, caffeine was chosen in uh, in this study. So uh, besides the fact that it is quite straight, straightforward, its effects are quite straightforward on the brain. Uh, it was also chosen due to uh, due to the low li likelihood that that sets won't be accessible. At least that's what I thought initially when I started this study. Um, now I've had some issues with uh, getting either access or actually finding uh, AG data sets where caffeine was. Um, analyzed. Um, and uh, yeah, it's also true that uh, caffeine is uh, the most used psychoactive drug in the world, and that would make uh, uh, creating a MATLAB script that tackles its uh, activities um, of much more importance and applicability in the future. Um, so uh, again, with regards to caffeine so and EEG, uh, in EEG, we have uh, several uh, zones on the head where we record certain activities. 
uh, as uh, uh, you have a map here. And um, with regards to the uh, FZ, uh, CZ, and PZ, which correspond to the uh, well frontal lobe, uh, the PZ to the uh, parietal lobe, and the CZ to the um, sulcus between them, which is uh, the central sulcus, um, as it, it is showing the image, the um, the thick line between the blue and the yellow uh, lobes of the brain. Um, so. Uh, the effects of caffeine uh, are quite, uh, they're, they're not very uh, visible with the naked eye, but by running a T-test, I've uh, seen that even after five minutes of uh, caffeine consumption in one study, uh, the T-test showed that in the, um, in the, in the posterior uh, temporal lobe, for example, where uh, the effects of caffeine are particularly obvious, um, the p-value was about 0 0.14, which uh, is, it, well, it isn't uh, lower than the standard 0 0.05. It is still significant seeing that uh, the effects of caffeine usually take about uh, 20 to 30 minutes to actually settle in. So the fact that after just five minutes, the p-value dropped from what is normally about 95, uh, uh, 0 0.95, uh, drop to about 0 0.14 is enough to show that there are some um, uh, differences uh, that have to be tackled. Um, goals of this project, so uh, obviously developing a MATLAB script to tackle these uh, ways, um, the ways that EEG recordings are changed by the consumption of caffeine, and also to assess um, some effects of various psychoactive drugs on BCIs, if there are any, especially with caffeine, for example, uh, some drugs could be uh, could be helpful in brain computer uh, integration because there are some issues with that. Uh, for example, um, there's an immune response with uh, BCIs that uh, usually impede um, these uh, devices from recording um, electrical signals, uh, not just momentarily but also on a long uh, period of time. And uh, these immune responses may also damage the neurons um, nearby, which further causes issues with not only recording but also making it safe for the patient uh, to uh, for this to be um, for these uh, electrical values to be recorded um, applications uh, the types for see for this study would be well uh, especially for patients that will use BCIs on a daily basis that would include um, in the future for example patients may have an implant in their brain, which would be connected to a prosthetic or to the limbs and be able to move them even though, um, to move them simply with the brain, uh, whether they're paralyzed or they lose, uh, lost the, uh, that limb. So uh, in these patients uh, that would use BCIs on a daily basis, it would help tremendously um, because they could consume drugs without worrying the, uh, that um, BCIs will start malfunctioning and uh, take the um, take wrong values for the um, for the electrical signals and maybe hurt them or just not respond at all. Um, uh, other applications could include diagnostic uses. For example, the parts of the algorithm that um, I'm developing could be used to actually detect. Um, uh, caffeine or other drugs consumption in, uh, in patients without uh, the need for blood tests or for example, to actually confirm some other uh, tests. Uh, this could be done much uh, quicker than blood tests or other kinds of tests because you just have to um, uh, put the, uh, the EEG, um, um, the EEG apparatus on the head and just record these electrical signals and you're done with. So that would take about 15 minutes. Um, uh, more applications would be possibly even metaverse if people in the future choose to connect themselves to the virtual world. Uh, they wouldn't want to uh, drugs in the real world to stop them from doing so. So um, this, uh, um, this MATLAB script could help with that as well. Uh, the methodology would be uh, well using BCI data sets, uh, mainly EEG, um, uh, even though the availability is quite low. I mean, I've been actually able to find uh, brain recordings of people watching the Twilight Zone instead of um, EEGs of caffeine. Uh, so yeah, it's much rarer than I expected, but I'm uh, I'm, I'm uh, dealing with that. Yeah, uh, main method of data analysis 
includes a uh, principal component analysis, uh, ANOVA, and T-test. Uh, I'll get a bit into that. Uh, I'll get into that uh, more. Uh, I'll, I'll get into that a bit later. And the script develop might be used for other kinds of BCIs as well. But uh, it's hard to say if that will be the case. Uh, I'm thinking that uh, seeing how different um, um, uh, the I, I mean they're quite uh, similar uh, different BCIs, but the styles may impede uh, the algorithm from properly um, um, from properly functioning. And uh, I believe that it might have to be slightly adjusted for various interfaces. So the main way that this algorithm would work. Uh, which I'm developing right now would be well. Uh, so we have data set um, uh, B and um, database, sorry, uh, B and A, with B being before caffeine and A being after caffeine. So in first instance, uh, we'd have every X period of time, for example, 10 minutes, uh, the uh, register um, the AG of this patient for Y amount of time, for example, 10 seconds. And compare it with the EEG frame registered uh, one set ago. So EEG n registered now is compared to EEG n minus two registered twenty minutes ago. Then um, uh, the algorithm would break down um, the EEG into into frequency bands and select the nine to fifteen uh, hertz bandwidth, which is where the main um, um, differences in. Uh, AEG uh, recordings occur, uh, and it, this would also catch uh, various uh, patients because not all patients would have the same response to caffeine and other uh, small bandwidths may, might be different from patient to patient. Uh, then uh, it would Fourier transform that uh, to obtain a graph where the x-axis is the 9 to 15 bandwidth, and then PCA that to find the bandwidths or the sections where most differences take place to select a shorter, more precise uh, bandwidth, which we'll call bandwidth T, for example. Um, then on these uh, selected bandwidths, uh, it would perform, uh, perform a t-test. And if P value is uh, less than, for example, 0 0.30, uh, this value would be uh, assessed later, but to be able to catch the uh, caffeine at its um, to be able to catch uh, caffeine uh, in its more subtle uh, uh, forms, uh, I would include a higher value than 0 0.05. Um, then uh, I would do, uh, then it would perform that analysis, which should include getting the absolute value of each va of the absolute of each value uh, to uh, avoid the means being equal to zero, for example. Uh, apply uh, then it to apply ANOVA to get the means of each column, the means between the uh, data set of the caffeinated uh, EEG and the control one. So it would have it would come up with means of each uh, value there, and uh, then it would add the um, these uh, mean values to the uh, database uh, A, which is the after caffeine, to get something that more resembles the uh, uh, database uh, B. Uh, this is uh, so it would add these mean values because uh, caffeine has uh, an effect as far as I'm aware of and as far as uh, I've seen in uh, literature, it has uh, the effect of um, lowering the peaks while also uh, uh, increasing a bit uh, the tropes. So um, uh, to, to get something that more resembles uh, normal EEG, we would have to add these mean values. Then the data would be reprocessed, so um, to get back an EEG by um, by noting down basically which uh, values were uh, positive and which were negative, and then just reverse that. Com uh, it would then compare the new EEG to control EEG, and uh, if p value is uh, still uh, under uh, the assigned value, like uh, as it, uh, as uh, zero point thirty. Then um, it would do this uh, process uh, again. If it is higher than the p-value that is assigned, then it would um, uh, it would accept this uh, transformation, and it uh, would note how many of these transformations need to occur to reach uh, p-value higher than what is assigned, and use these uh, transformations for the rest of the EEG so that it uh, it doesn't have to analyze it uh, each time uh, there's uh, uh, EEG coming through, and this would function until um, the uh, effects of the caffeine um, 
um, uh, drop, uh, and uh, this would work by in parallel also uh, selecting um, sections of uh, the G2 compared to control data. Um, work achieved so far, so the effects of caffeine have been mostly uh, assessed, not just on the CNS, but also on the whole body. Um, that analysis is still ongoing and uh, getting the AEG data uh, is still a part of the work. Um, final script will be developed in the following weeks. And re with regards to limitations, uh, there is a well, lack of proper AEG data access. I've been, so, so far I've been, I've, I have access only to one EEG data set and um, uh, that one is quite problematic. The methodology isn't quite, isn't quite on my liking um, due to the short amount of time that they allowed for caffeine to actually take its uh, effect. Uh, but I'm working with Dr. Alejandro to actually contact some, um, some researchers to uh, get a hold of some more EEG data sets, which so far has been uh, quite troublesome, yeah. Uh, the script being uh, usable for EEG, uh, I'm sure about BC uh, other BCIs. Um, this uh, was my presentation. I'll leave here my uh, uh, contact. Uh, there are two separate uh, email addresses. If there are any questions or suggestions for how I should go on with my study, Um, I have a question that is more related to the BCI application, if that's okay. Um, because yeah, yeah. Uh, you've talked about how BCI can be used to mitigate or alleviate symptoms of physical disabilities, but I was wondering whether there have been studies or there has been research on how BCIs can help physical symptoms that derive from neurodegenerative diseases. So for example, Parkinson, like if you know anything about that. Uh, yeah, I actually do. Uh, there have been some studies uh, done on uh, so this, uh, yeah, there have been some studies done on uh, stimulating various parts of the brains uh, through uh, actually uh, deep brain stimulation to um, manage the symptoms, not only of Parkinson's, but also of uh, OCD and depression as well recently. So uh, yeah, definitely uh, that, that uh, uh, those things are also tackled. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Robert, for a very interesting talk. Uh, first question was, uh, you mentioned the negative effects of the drugs, especially thanks for warning us against caffeine. <laughs> so is there any positive effects as well? Uh, I remember at one point you were mentioning that uh, the integration of the, the signal receiver and the brain needs some specific drug which would be useful. So my question is, is there any positive effects of drugs in any way? I mean, uh, yeah, definitely. So there was a study that proposes, uh, propose, proposed the uh, use of caffeine to actually uh, combat the, uh, the effects of um, sleep, um, of not sleeping for long, uh, a long amount of times on EEG, especially in, uh, with diagnostic purposes, because uh, sleep... Um, uh, so if you have a patient that uh, does not sleep, whether they have insomnia or perhaps they have some other kind of issue, it might affect uh, EEG as well, especially in, that, in uh, diagnostic um, um, uh, environments. And uh, the, use of EEG, uh, the, the use of caffeine has been proposed to actually uh, tackle these changes, uh, although I'm not very familiar of, uh, with uh, whether these um, are very potent or whether they should be actually used in a clinical setting, but I've encountered the paper where, yeah, this, uh, uh, this use has also been considered. Thank you. Uh, the second one would be on the, uh, the, I really guess the methods for this EEG and receiving the signals would be passive, but is there any way the, the measuring instrument might in, itself uh, cause any slight effects. As in uh, whether... Uh, the, the receiving, uh, the, the integrated, the machinery or the signal receiver you use itself causes a slight disturbance or a, a impedance in the some part of the lobe or is there any effect of the measuring instrument itself? I mean, or is uh, it fully passive? 
I mean, I believe that it's fully the caffeine, mainly because I've performed the T test, at least on the data sets that I have. And the T sets, uh, the, the T set uh, showed that a p value of 0.14. So even if the machine were throwing a bit off uh, the results, uh, not only would, would it throw the results off of, of uh, in the um, control EEG and also in the caffeinated EEG, but I don't think it would cause um, such a low p-value, especially because I've also looked into the p-values of other brain regions in the same patient, and uh, those had a p-value of about 0 0.99, so that is basically the same uh, uh, EEG recordings, so no uh, caffeine effect there. So, uh, yeah, and, and considering other research papers uh, in the past as well, uh, I believe that the effects of caffeine are quite considerable, yeah. Okay, thanks. Just to reiterate the question, I think I didn't make it clear. The, let's say the EEG, I, I, let's assume a number, the result after caffeine, before caffeine, the EEG result was, say, 0.10. After caffeine, let's say it's B.20. Sorry, it's just a crude numbers. So before the EEGs, before caffeine is 0 0.10, after caffeine is 0 0.20. My question is, in theory, imaginary, if the EEG and the machinery you are using, if it's contactless and fully passive, will the 0 0.10 be 0 0.05? I'm asking, is there any implications from the machine or the way you get the results itself? So instead of, wait, uh, so I'm not sure if I'm getting this properly, but uh, so you're saying whether the, whether the recording uh, might be, I, I'm, I'm not very sure, so. Yeah, the, the, the recording system or the machinery, the whatever the system used, do you think they affect the study? Instrumentation? Oh, you mean uh, between different BCIs, for example? If they... Yes, yeah. So, some of them should be incorporated directly in the brain, right? like physically. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah definitely. Like that. Yeah, yeah I, I, I do believe, I mean, uh, with EEG, there's a lot of background noise from uh, other neurons and other regions uh, there, which are also active. And with LFPs, for example, it would uh, register the electrical activity in just one place. So uh, I do believe that um, that uh, these, I mean, uh, it would be different between different BCIs, specifically because of this uh, instance and because uh, other regions are affected differently by caffeine. So um, by having uh, that in mind, uh, yeah, that is also why I'm uh, not sure whether the MATLAB script that I'm developing would be also usable for other BCIs. But uh, we'll see. I mean, uh, uh, this is the first time anyone has proposed any ways to tackle uh, these issues in this manner, for example. And um, if other researchers join in and uh, want to develop their own scripts and uh, try to tackle the effects of either caffeine or other uh, drugs, then well, we'll see if they uh, they can work in a similar manner for in a similar manner for um, LFPs as with EEG, for example. Well, thank you. Uh, sorry for not putting the question correctly in the first place. The last one, uh, it's not any more questions, but. Uh, Will you be happy sharing any more fun facts like this uh, uh, on the recent advancements? Like I remember the Neuralink one, the, the implant inside a monkey and driving it to play video games automatically, right? Something like this. Like, uh, is there any more advances we are missing? Would you like to share something on this? Uh, as far as I'm aware, there's also there has also been so again with Neuralink, um, Elon Musk has actually well his team has mapped the neurons in uh, that connect the snout uh, to the motor homunculus of that pig. So basically, uh, when the snout would touch a point, it would know exactly where on the snout, uh, 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 where exactly which point uh, the snout uh, touched the object, uh, because it uh, a certain a cluster of neurons would activate in the motor homunculus, which was mapped by the team just to prove that they can do that. Um, another instance, um, I'm, I'm not very sure. Um, 
I, I, I know there have been some more unique advancements that but, but I, I, I can't uh, recall any on off the top of my head really. Uh, as a fun fact, I guess, um, there's uh, there are some plans. Uh, so if I can remember uh, correctly, so the uh, caffeine can also be used uh, as a fun fact, for example, caffeine can also be used to um, to switch off the analgesic effects of La Pacha tea, for example. I just stumbled upon this information, which is a tea uh, made from the bark of a tree in South America, if I remember correctly, and it's uh, it uh, even though it has analgesic effects, it doesn't act through the opioid system, but it acts through the um, adenosine system, which is also responsible for uh, our sleep and for uh, basically why we feel tired at the end of the day. And La Pacha tea basically can reverse these effects. Uh, other fun facts, I'm, I, I can't really recall uh, at, at this. Oh, and also uh, uh, theobromine in, uh, um, in chocolate, which is the main compound uh, in chocolate, yeah. Uh, that also has an effect on the uh, adenosine system in the brain, but uh, it isn't as potent as caffeine, mainly because um, uh, one, it has a lower affinity for the receptors uh, for uh, adenosine, and two, because it actually has a lower um, a lower solubility in lipid membranes, so it can't pass through the blood-brain barrier as easily, uh, simply because it misses one methyl group as compared to caffeine. So yeah. Final question: Is it is it safer to eat chocolates? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot. That was very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.